Hey, welcome to the Science of Parenting podcast, where we connect you with research-based information that fits your family. We'll talk about the realities of being a parent and how research can help guide our parenting decisions. I'm Mackenzie Johnson, parent of two littles with their own quirks, and I'm a parenting educator. And I'm Lori Cordles, parent of three in two different life stages. Two are launched, and one is in high school, and I am also a parenting educator. And here we are again talking about temperament. We're in season seven. We have been sharing for several weeks now about the idea of looking at temperament from a child development perspective. We took our season five child development ages and stages, all those developmental things and combine it with season three, which was all about those nine temperament traits. And so we have been, I, I don't know, sort of uh, marrying, combining, collaborating, all of the alls, right? Ta <laughs> Mishmashing, talking about those developmental milestones and how temperament can interact with, play into it, um, enhance at times those temperament <laughs> traits. Highlights. Enhance. Highlight. Yes. I was going to say other words. Those are probably, that's plenty. Those are plenty. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. That works. That works. Oh, uh, yeah. And that we get to talk about middle childhood, right? And what is it? I don't know what it is about this stage in particular. I think it's because all the rest, I feel like, no, they have a name. Like you're a preschooler, you're a toddler, you're a teen. You're a school age, middle childhood. Yeah. <laughs> not middle school, middle childhood. No. Early. No. Late, yeah. Middle. I, and yes, it, 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 yeah. Is. so we're talking about the ages from six to 11 today. If oh, you have a child in those ages, if you know a child in those ages, if you were once a child in those ages, been there, that's what we're focusing on today. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, we get to see how that temperament is going to interact with this age. How do we see it come out to play with the developmental tasks that kids are working on um, when they are school agers? Maybe I just need to like mm -hmm. I'm gonna let go of the middle childhood thing. School agers. Yeah. <laughs> School agers. Let's do that. <laughs> uh, but one thing that we do know about temperament and honestly, lots of things um, is that it influences our relationship with our kids because parenting is actually a bi-directional process. So, you know, so often we think about like, well, I'm the parent. I impact my child. Right. All these things of if parents would just or, you know, and there's this aspect of but also my child influences me as a parent, right? My mm -hmm. child's temperament mm -hmm. being a big one, of course, which we focus on. Um, but, you know, there's also things like gender, gender identity, birth order, health status, all of these other factors that mix in that affect us as parents and how we parent and just this little cycle of like, our child impacts us. We do this thing. Our child does this thing. We impact our child, right? Mm. Round and round we go. And around hopefully and around and around, right? Yeah, hopefully it's like a carousel and not like a <laughs> sickening merry-go-round or anything. Hopefully right? we ride yeah. on the carousel. <laughs> yes. But so, yeah, we get yeah. to see how we're going to talk a little bit about how that temperament comes out to play in middle childhood and, yeah, how it intermixes with these developmental milestones, as we call them, um, in Middle childhood. I just said I wasn't going to say it anymore. Yeah. In middle childhood, in our school ages. In, middle, in our school ages. Something like that. So <laughs> anyway. let's just take a quick moment to remember what temperament is. And we have been sharing a definition, uh, one that Mary Rothbart and her colleagues used. But I came across something last week as we were researching, and it has stuck with me. Even uh, in the middle of the night, I'll wake up and think, oh, Oh, that's, oh, I love that. And so uh, in a good way, middle of the night, right? It's, it's all right. It, it hasn't been, you know, Dreaming. an anxiety ridden middle of the night. It's just, yeah. But this idea that temperament is our factory settings. So when you that. get, I guess it's just like, think of my phone, right? So yeah. here are where the factory settings. Okay. And this is how it works. This is how I work. This is what, how temperament made we work. And then what happens is we begin to put all these apps on our phone, right? Mm -hmm. Things that help us, things that remind us, ways we want to behave, remember. And that's what temperament is. So temperament is that foundation. And then interactions we have with others, uh, those close to us in our lives, our teachers, our family members, our neighbors, um, all of those things begin to adjust the factory settings. 
Yes. Now, here's the deal. Remember, those factory settings are always there, right? And yes. oftentimes when we are highly stressed, very sick, we return to those factory settings and temperament. And so that has just been swirling around in my mind. And, you know, my mind is kind of a, a, a swirl anyway. So add in this idea of factory settings. Oh, I've been thinking about that all along. Yes. Yes. Okay. So when you shared this earlier, I took notes on why I think it's a beautiful metaphor. Okay. Temperament. Okay. So one of the things I love was this idea of when you have your baby, when you adopt a child, when you, whatever it might be, when this child arrives mm -hmm. in your life, you're opening the package and you don't know exactly what you're going to get, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know exactly what temperament they're going to be gifted. You might have some insight like, mm -hmm. okay, my co-parent and I are both yada, yada in terms of temperament. So you might have some insight, but ultimately you haven't had that experience with their temperament. Kind of like when you right. open a brand new phone, maybe it's the upgraded model. So you have a sense maybe, but really it's like maybe. brand new package. <laughs> it's like, I got to learn this, right? I got to figure out how mm -hmm. this thing works with the settings it's given. Um, okay. So that was one thing. Another one is that it's always in the background, right? Mm -hmm. You open up that phone for the first time and those settings are just there. They're going to be there. The They're not going to go away. Um, mm -hmm. But I also love to like, but wait, like, so the factory wait, settings is also more. things like, right? The, but the factory settings is also like what ringtone it's automatically on. Oh, I love that. Right? Uh -huh. Like there's yes. also, that's also part of the factory settings. And it's like, but that can be adjusted and adapted, right? Like, like mm -hmm. with the apps and reminders, we can learn ways to adapt with our temperament. So I, I love like, this. It's there. It's in the background. It's genetic. Yeah. It's not changing, but yeah, the way we can learn to interact with the world and navigate the world with our temperament can be adjusted. The ringtones can be mm -hmm. adjusted. The brightness, right? The way mm -hmm. we navigate the world with it can be adjusted. So I was like, oh. Mm -hmm. Look at your metaphor. Well, and this should we go I back do. and record everything? <laughs> right? Well, what I do, I think this is what happens. You bring this like brilliant word picture into my brain and my brain's mm. like, hey, don't let this go. Add nine more things yeah. to it. <laughs> <laughs> but also you said something and I kept thinking, oh my gosh, what is our expectation when we open the package? And then what's oh. the reality? Yes. Ooh. I think of the transition. This is so silly. But like Oof. when my phone went from having a button on the bottom to now mm. I have no button on my touch screen. Yes. It's touch screen only. Like there's no home button. And I think of how big of a transition that was for me. And I'm like, Hey, remember that time that you had a baby that was very spirited and it was not what you expected. <laughs> right? And I had to learn a whole new way of doing things without a home button. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And a whole new phone. The next time you got a different phone, like you had a, another yeah. baby had another and baby. you totally got different. a whole different version. Mm -hmm. Totally. different. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> So yeah, I, yes, I, this could, this could be a, this could just open you up so many more podcasts. <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay. But ages six to 11, that school yeah. ager, right? Okay. So, so what is happening developmentally? That's what we want to talk about. What developmentally, just a quick reminder of the age of six to 11, what are they learning? What's, what do their body look like? What are they thinking? Oh, please help us learn what they're thinking. Right. <laughs> so they have grown into this a uh, tiny human being, tiny adult, maybe they have way more language. They have lots more physical skills. Um, they can, they can, they can argue and discuss with us, right? They can um, negotiate with uh, family members with, they're learning how to negotiate with friends. Um, physically, they have a lot of different skills. They might even be playing some organized sports. So sure. uh, physically, they're more mature, a little bit more coordination. The, the age of six to 11, boo, a lot happens. We talked about cutting yeah. this down into different, you know, shorter segments, but we're going to stick with this middle childhood school age age. But, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that looks different the, from the age of six to the age of 11. Um, and so as we think about this is a really critical time that, you know, children are developing confidence in all areas of their life. As you think about schoolwork and friends and even just confidence around the house with household chores or around the neighborhood, riding their bike up and down yeah. uh, the, the driveway, right? Then onto the sidewalk, then down to the corner. OK, so a lot of different things happen during this age frame. Oh, and I think you just highlighted, you know, 
you might if you listened back in season five when we did the ages and stages on school agers, we talked we did we talked about this big range between six to eleven. But I think the thing you highlighted is like this: they're still in the same kind of stage of development, di- like same like similar milestones. The difference between age six and age eleven is how much, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like learning to get yourself ready in the morning when you're six, right? Like what are the things that I need versus Mm -hmm. how much more elevated it is to get yourself ready when you're 11. Um, Yeah. Like I can ride my bike now that I'm six, right? I have this figured out versus I can run back to the corner versus I can ride my bike to my friend's house versus I can. (laughs) That's the difference. And I want to ride farther, right? And I want to ride farther. Yes. And I do, you know, we talk about mastery, is a huge part of being like a school ager. I'm like, that's what's happening here, the mastery. Mm. And so, yeah, they are getting more independence from us and our family. Um, You know, you might notice their interest in their friends is really increasing Mm -hmm. at this age. And so friendship is a huge part of healthy development for our school age kids. They don't spend all their time at home with us anymore. They're like, oh, I'm in this extra activity and Mm -hmm. and I like with my friends. Or I want to go down to the neighbor's house or right wherever they might be. Uh, But because Mm -hmm. friendship is increasingly important, important, we also start to see the beginnings of peer pressure Um, because they really value these social relationships. Some kids, particularly related to their temperament, can be more prone to that peer uh, pressure. You know, sometimes just risk taking. I even think I jumped out of a tree and broke my leg during this stage like (laughs) because I was taunted. (laughs) Actually, uh, by my sibling. Well, funny, so did I. So did I, but it was my wrist, right? <laughs> so yes. <laughs> See, oh. I don't know. Maybe that's a rite of passage: breaking yeah. a bone in middle childhood. Yes, <laughs> but the risk taking and the peer pressure can increase. Um, so yeah, it can be important. Help our kids with the, that confidence. Help building those skills to navigate those social relationships. That's a lot mm-hmm. of what we focus on <laughs> in this school age. But also a few more that I think are interesting. That I'm like. Okay, don't go on and on, but a few more worth highlighting. One, they're starting to be able to handle a little more responsibility, right? Along with that mastery of tasks, right? I can handle at six, I can handle even more responsibility at 11 of being able to go further on my bike, of handling more household tasks, of maybe doing my own laundry, of things like that. Yeah, responsibility. Yeah, that's a good one. Right? Responsibility. Um, okay, and then two more, and I'll keep them quick. Uh, one, <laughs> thinking about, for some kids, puberty will start during this middle childhood, um, you know, mm-hmm. towards that age of 10, 11, especially for girls, um, you know, and so helping prepare our kids for that is something that's important during this time period. And that for those 11-year-olds, depending on what school district you're in, you might be getting ready to go to middle school. And so the transition mm-hmm. of how that's very different than the experience that they've had in elementary school. So anyway, exactly. lots going on with our school age kids. Lots and lots. There is a ton. And, and Dr. Diana Lang is a faculty member at Iowa State University. And she has given us um, permission to utilize her book. And in her book, she talks specifically about temperament in this age range And the temperament theorists that she talks about in her book are ones that we've talked about, and that's Thomas and Chess. And they really identify that the idea of goodness of fit, of parents and adults really taking the time to understand children's temperament allows for us to have this more positive relationship because we begin to understand that natural factory setting, right? And especially as these children go out into the world more in schools and formal settings, the more adults that can understand that natural factory setting and how to work with it allows for this idea of a better fit, a more mutual understanding, um, more uh, positive interactions, and just that that back and forth, like you said, bi-directional opportunities. And this really is important during this age as children kind of begin to decide who am I in this great big world? Yes. Yes. And I, yeah, you know, you, you mentioned confidence, you know, responsibility, mastery, all of these things and Mm -hmm. the feelings about who they are as people, um, you know, can really be solidified during the, you know, these, these years. And so, yeah, we want to understand our kids' temperament help them develop, you know, sometimes it's us developing goodness of fit, but sometimes it's helping them learn the skills to create better fit in their environments. 
maybe by asking for what they need, by learning strategies to adapt, whatever it might be. So there is, there's a, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> There is. Okay. So let's pull the two together. Let's pull temperament in. We're going to, again, going to use Thomas and Chess's nine different traits. And as we look through these traits with that lens of the six to 11 year old, remember what we're looking at is how much of each particular trait did, did the child receive? Because it's a continuum, right? Mm -hmm. They either received a little bit of this trait from us genetically or a lot. And as we talk through the age and temperament uh, kind of collaboration, let's call it a collaboration between development and temperament. How can we as the adult caregiver really help them begin to understand their temperament? And how can we, the adult caregiver, have a better fit with them and their temperament instead of trying to change the temperament? Yes. Because we know that can happen, right? That's not happening. That doesn't work. All right. So I'm going to start off with activity level and then I'll let you kind of continue on. So activity level, that natural energy, that natural um, kind of gusto in terms of how fast or how slow do we move? And think of this as children at this age, they move, they're involved in things that make them move, right? So do they feel more energized after moving? Or is this something where, you know, they might be energized and active and then need a break? So a more active or highly active school age child, you might find them racing out to the playground at recess and spending a majority of their recess um, doing things like climbing and running and kicking and I'm um, really engaging in that movement type of activity and that's energizing them and giving them energy for the rest of the day where a less active child, you know, they might run out to the playground, um, take a couple pumps on the swing, climb up the gym equipment and take a break and watch everyone for a bit. And then they might jump back in. They might join in a little basketball game but they're gonna just take more breaks um, because their energy, uh, they can get more energy for the rest of the day with a, a few of those breaks in between. Uh, it's that idea of a dance, a collaboration between the brain, right? The brain is growing, yep. the brain is moving and the physical body. So that coordination. Um, more active children probably have spent more time practicing. And so they might even be a little bit more coordinated during this age while less active children you know, they're not spending all of their time practicing. They're spending some time here and there. Uh, so they might, you know, be still working on some of those coordination types of things. And oh, I, yeah. I do think that as I look at activity level in this age, I think specifically of, you know, them sitting in their desks um, and in a classroom or, or um, being more prone to uh, less active things as they're focusing on school lessons. And so we really need to pay attention to this activity level because the activity level isn't going to stop when they're sitting at their desk, yes. right? Their activity level then may come out in, are they tapping pencils? Are they moving their foot? Are they mm -hmm. shifting in their seats, right? So a highly active child might still be wiggling in their seat while a less active child can sit quietly. Yes. Which makes me extra grateful that, you know, there's kind of this movement in schools around flexible seating. Um, yes. and so it's like, yeah, an active kid can really benefit from that opportunity to get some of that out while mm -hmm. doing the task that they need to. So definitely. Absolutely. Love that. Um, Absolutely. Because activity level, yeah, doesn't stop after recess. It's like, oh, you were active then? Now, no more. It doesn't. No. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. They still have all the, all that energy bursting out when they've got that high. It is. Level. So it's coming out their fingertips and toes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, all right. And then I'm going to look at approach and adaptability. And as you know, these two are similar, sometimes create a little confusion. Um, but I tend to think about approach as in what's new, right? When things are a new people, new situation, new place. And so, you know, even at like first day of school, how did your child feel? A high approach child, you know, might be excited. They're excited to show people their new backpack or their new school supplies or whatever that might be. Or, you know, you might have a low approach kid that maybe he's feeling a little cautious or I hear mine say, I I'm a little nervous, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? That's maybe not quite as sure. And so our low approach kids can use some coaching a lot of times of helping reduce the newness is what comes to mind for me of like, yeah, moving to school the first day of school in particular. But when you're in a new place, like 
it smells new, it looks new, there's new people, mm -hmm. all of these things. And so with our low approach kids, they can really benefit from when we can help reduce that newness by helping them know what to expect. Um, exactly. You know, what's going to be similar and things like that versus our kids that are more high approach might need some coaching on risks, right? <laughs> <laughs> I remember in our interview with uh, Rob Copeland, we were chatting and then I was like, oh yeah, somebody's got to heed caution. <laughs> Right, <laughs> probably isn't the one doing it, right? Yes. And so helping them understand, that, like, to slow down, be like, I don't have to say yes immediately to everything, um, which is something I still work on as an adult. But <laughs> oh, uh, you know, which is similar but different to adaptability, which is really focused on unexpected or transition, mm -hmm. both of those things. Um, you know, for a high adaptability child, the unexpected maybe isn't as stressful for them. You know, that a little bit mm -hmm. easier going from those things. Uh, it's easier for them to go with the flow. So they might not be your natural planner for homework, right? Like, well, I don't know. I was just kind of going with where the night took me. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, a less adaptable child might be the planner of this is what I'm doing. This is what's coming up. Um, but also, I think what's really important with adaptability is during the school day, especially during like elementary school, there's a lot of transitions. Maybe we're transitioning yes. subjects. Maybe they have a different classroom for different subjects or if they have a special, right, like an art or a PE mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, there's a lot of transitions during the day. And so I actually picture I was like, as a parent. I might not see all that, but I might see the less adaptable kid that gets in the car at pickup or mm -hmm. when you pick them up from after school care or wherever that they are exhausted and barely holding it together. And that absolutely okay, we just got to stop at the grocery store quick on the way. <gasps> oh, can't we just go? Home? <laughs> um, you know, and I think of when we have those sometimes in this age, they've got practice, they've got commitments, extracurriculars. And so the, in the evening of okay, we're going to stop home, grab this, we're going to go do this, and then we're going to come home, eat supper, and then we got to get to bed, and then we got to, um, that for a less adaptable kid, that can be a really hard thing. And so they like to be prepared for what's mm -hmm. coming. And so we do, we see those, yes. that approach and adaptability are definitely here. Always there in the background, right? Those factory settings. Always in the background. Always the, and, and like you said, they all day long, they've been adapting all day yeah. long, they've been flexible. They've been holding it together. And you get them in the car and you say, oh, guess what? We're going to go get to We get to go do this. And you think they're going to be so excited and they have a meltdown. And right. that is so hard as a parent, right? Yeah. Right. And like you're okay. a schoolager. I wasn't expecting a meltdown. I know. You're totally <laughs> tapped out. You've given all yes. of your adaptability to the people in the school. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh. Mm. And then, okay, so let's pile on a little intensity <laughs> and sensitivity, right? Yes. So intensity is that natural oomph that they come with. So mm -hmm. did they get a lot of oomph or did they get just a little bit? So especially when it comes to this age group, as they're navigating their friendships and navigating these new experiences outside of the home, a, a more intense kid, uh, they might be very loud. They could be come off. They could be coming off as brash. They could be coming mm -hmm. off as um, a bull in a china closet. Mm -hmm. You know those types of uh, words that we use. As you know, they just have a lot of oomph, and they do everything with a lot of oomph. Uh, versus the child who, you know, when their friend gives them a gift, they might just smile or maybe not smile because it, you know, Thank they're you. inside, they're happy, but outside their face hasn't said it yet. And so mm -hmm. as a parent, we need to understand and help them also understand their intensity level. Um, I, I think of the child who uh, maybe exclaims loudly and their friend might think they're mad at them when actually it was, you know, just a loud exclamation or the friend who, yeah, has given them a gift or done a really nice favor um, and they haven't, um, you know, maybe said thank you or maybe they didn't, um, it, maybe they didn't acknowledge that gift or a special favor in the way the friend thought. Yes. So helping children understand their intensity. Uh, they don't, they're not aware of their expressions. They're not aware of what cues they give off. So that's intensity level. Uh, and then I love what Mary Shidi Kursinka says about sensitivity. She says, some children just come with a super set of sensors. Yes. So sensitivity is all those senses. And a highly sensitive child is 
super sensitive to, you know, things like taste, touch, smell, um, even emotions, right? So mm -hmm. as you look at navigating those friendships, they might be more sensitive, again, to someone not acknowledging a gift or not acknowledging um, a bid for friendship. They might yes. be more sensitive if they're left out of a group. Uh, they might, you know, a more sensitive kid might notice uh, the teacher's look from across the room as the classroom gets a little loud. But conversely, the less sensitive children in the classroom may not even notice the teacher's frustration level rising. They not on actually their radar. might not notice. No, not even on their radar. They might not notice the teacher uh, turn the light off to grab attention, right? They're not sensitive. The they're they just don't even notice that little subtle hint. They don't notice the subtle hints of their friends. And so again, we need to help them recognize what what are the other cues that other people are giving. What are the social cues that are happening, especially during this age group? Oh, yeah. Well, and then, yeah, rolling right along on that, similar to sensitivity, which is a lot to do with that sensory emotional experience, there's distractibility, which also has to do with attention. You know, both, exactly. both pieces of sensitivity and distractibility fit into this concept of attention. Um, in mm -hmm. particular for a highly distractible kid, you know, I, I, the daydreamer, right. That like my brain has lots of things to think about places to go, things to notice, things to take in, um, that, yeah, it might be, yes, they're supposed to be sitting down, like working on this, or yes, they're not supposed to be chatting with their neighbor, but they had this really thin, really specific thing that I needed to tell them. <laughs> um, I just remembered. I just remembered and I got to tell them because my brain will be somewhere else in a few minutes and it'll be gone. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that attention for the highly distractible, you know, versus that less distractible child, it might be easier to tune people out. Um, mm -hmm. for that less attractable child. I think I've already said this example in a previous episode, but I'm amazed when we talk through stuff on our team meetings, Barb, Barb Ben Swanson, our like content curator can just like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm not listening to you guys. I'm doing this. And I'm like, oh, that is not a thing I can do. It's <laughs> 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 not a thing I, I've learned to, to navigate the environment with that skill. <laughs> um, but so that attention, the highly distractible versus the less distractible. And then it's sidekick. Um, particularly yes. when it comes to homework, <laughs> it's sidekick mm -hmm. to is persistence. Um, so mm -hmm. this is also sometimes called frustration tolerance. So mm -hmm. a child with a high frustration tolerance might be the kid that's like, I'm not done yet. I need mm -hmm. to finish this. This isn't, I, I really caution from using this word in my house. I'm trying to let it out of my vocabulary, but perfect. It's not perfect ah. yet. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that highly persistent child, you know, I got to stick it out. I got to come back to this. I can't let this go. Or it's hard for me to let this go, I should mm -hmm. say, versus the less persistent child that's like, this is too hard, right? This is overwhelming to me. I don't like to feel frustrated. Yes. I'd rather just not do this. Um, and so, yeah, both of these traits of distractibility and persistence, huge things, as Lori pointed out to me earlier, related to homework. Yes. Lots of conflicts yes. between parents and kids around this because, and mm -hmm. one other thing you might not, I was going to say, maybe you could tell them, I didn't give you any context. Lori said earlier <laughs> <she mentioned, laughs> that this idea of sometimes the things that helped you do homework well as a kid, or even as an adult, like help you to focus in, those might not be the things that help your kid, right? Maybe exactly. silence is what you needed. Maybe they need a little bit in the background, you know, mm -hmm. maybe you needed to work on it right when you got home from school so that you remembered to do it. Maybe they need a break um, and then can come back to it later or to take it in in little bites rather than to sit yes. down and crank it out. And so it is it's OK to say, you know what, maybe the way I did it isn't the way they would benefit most from doing it. So, yeah, homework. Absolutely. Absolutely. Homework. That, I think, is one of the biggest questions when I've done temperament profiles or temperament consultations, the biggest questions parents of this age have is how do we make it through homework? And yes. in all honesty, the thing is, is that you, you could be and you could end up battling your child around homework for three hours. Really, yeah, honestly, parents really, are like, oh yeah, yeah, that's it. That's average, Lori, right? For three hours. <laughs> yes. Okay. And, and why is that? Well, because I kept trying to tell them if they would just get it done, it would be done. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is true. But because of the child's temperament, and in this case, it's often the child who just needs 
things in little bites because they're not persistent and the parent is persistent or the parent is not persistent and have learned tools, tips, tri tools, tips, tricks, and techniques themselves yes. as they're older. Right. And so we recognize that children who need bite sized bits and pieces of homework, it's probably going to take them three hours to do their homework. However, giving them bite sized pieces, do a little bit, take a break, do a little break, take a break, do a little bit, take a break. That means that we aren't arguing with them for three hours. We actually might be enjoying them for three hours yes. and they get the breaks that they need to focus and submit homework. That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. This is a tough one for parents. This, this distractibility, persistence, homework, and the ages six to 11. Yes. Super hard. Absolutely. Well, and it's, it's really a new concept during this stage, right? That like mm -hmm. homework starts somewhere in this range, depending on your child's teacher. And so it yes. is a new challenge uh, that will continue yes. though, right? Through um, into the later years of like preteens, teens and stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. But we have well, two traits left, right? We do. We do. We have two traits. So let's toss in regularity because this one, as we talked about when they were smaller, this is a, a, the trait that parents most want to control, right? Because it has to do with mm. eating, sleeping and eliminating, right? The bowel, bathroom. Okay. <laughs> So as you look at this age group, these children are far more adept at controlling these things on their own. And they actually do a better job of telling you how they feel about these things, right? I'm not hungry now. I don't need to use the bathroom now. I need to use the bathroom right now. Uh, I'm not tired. I am tired. And so when it comes to regularity and we think about this and we think about this age, it really comes down to, again, helping them learn their cues. So helping them learn their cues if they are irregular means that we have to help them learn to recognize when they do become tired. Yes. We have to learn to help them recognize when they do need to use the bathroom. Um, and conversely, against that is that if they are a regular kid and they're in a very structured environment, that bathroom break might not be during the time that they usually need to use the bathroom. So how do we cooperate and collaborate with other people in their lives to say, you know, my child is a very regular kid. He's going to need a snack. If you guys are traveling and, you know, going on a field trip, can, can I toss a granola bar in his bag? Yes. Uh, and, and the same with bathrooming, uh, the idea of, you know, is there, is there a way to have these irregular kids have some flexibility to use the bathroom when they need to? And, and some of that is just honestly having open, honest conversations with your child and the other adults in their lives that it's okay for you to ask. It's okay to yes. stand up for how you feel, right? Yes. It's okay to express your needs. And so regularity, we also call it, call it biological rhythms. Um, that's super important to, to teach children that your needs, wants, and desires are super important and they're valuable. And so let's mm -hmm. talk about that. Yes. Listen to your body. <laughs> Listen to your body. Yes. Mm. And then the last one is mood. We've shared all along that, you know, mood is kind of that silly versus serious or somber uh, temperament trait. And so I look at the, uh, you know, the silly child of this age is probably notified that, that they are the class clown. Um, you know, they might just tell silly jokes. They laugh, you know, easily the big belly laugh and the more somber or serious child you know, they might giggle or smirk at a, at a joke or, um, you know, they might have that furrowed brow as the teacher is doing a lesson because they're really seriously thinking about it deep in thought. Um, and so, again, what are those social cues? What do friends and other adults expect uh, that feedback to look like? Um, and if that feedback is a furrowed brow, you know, what might someone else be thinking? And so it does become, again, important to share with the child Ooh, right now I see a big frown on your face. Are you really feeling like a frowny face or are you thinking hard about something? Yes. Okay. I had literally had Naha as you were just saying, oh. walking through this. Okay. So I have very, this is not related to kids in middle childhood. <laughs> I have very high mood. And so I do mm. come off as very silly and I'm not afraid to joke around. And I'm realizing that throughout my life, I've been very worried that people think I'm never serious, like, or that oh, I'm, yes. like, I'm not smart or that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, okay, I guess, yeah, it does relate to being a school ager and that like, just because you're silly, just because you have goofing around mm -hmm. doesn't mean 
your child is not learning doesn't mean your child, um, you know, isn't intelligent or can't perform mm -hmm. well or yeah. And so I'm like, you know, the whole silly yes. thing that I, people tend to yes. think, oh, high mood, what a good thing that you're so fun. But also like, okay, but people might also think, well, yeah, they're fun. Mm -hmm. They're not, they need to take this seriously. It's like, well, mm, exactly. It's not always either or. <laughs> And, and the opposite of that is, you know, the because they're somber and serious, maybe people think they're a snob. Oh, they, yes. don't, they don't like me. They don't like me because they, they never smile around me. Well, gosh, actually, they might really like you and they're really concentrating on how do I get into that friend group? Yes. Mm, mood. I feel like we don't focus on that one a lot, but I was like, oh, aha. <laughs> aha. <laughs> it clicks in new place. <laughs> mm. Oh, yes. Yes. So yeah, middle childhood and temperament, it's there all throughout. I mean, at every stage, but in this one in particular, we see it, you know, in their tasks related to homework and their, you know, friend mm -hmm. groups and they're spending more time outside of our home. And so what are kind of, what do you think of as we walk through this temperament, middle childhood, how they interact, what comes to mind for you, Lori? So I was thinking about all three of my girls as they were six to 11 year olds, they're all past that stage now. And um, I was thinking about how, you know, a couple of their traits are very opposite. So uh, one is uh, highly, highly sensitive. And she in second grade was moved to the front of the room because she's also distractible, right? And not very persistent. So her teacher, yes. uh, bless her heart, moved her to the front of the room to try to help her focus, which was a great idea when I fully supported but what we found out was that this particular classroom was in the northwest corner of the building. And here in Iowa, it's a little cold and typically uh. the northwest corners of any building. <laughs> and so the teacher had a uh, small little space heater under her desk. And my highly sensitive child, even though she was in the front of the room and less distractible because of the children all around her, she was now even more distracted by the hum of the space heater under the yes. desk. Yes. <laughs> it was su super sensitive. And so that during that age group, we were trying to, yeah. And then um, another daughter who is um, less approaching and, uh, you know, but very adaptable. I sometimes chuckle because she's got a positive mood and so, but, but not, but not particularly approaching. And it always surprised me when she would suddenly stop at something new. Like I, I, I just was constantly, I don't know why I was constantly surprised, but it would surprise yeah. me that, oh, well, she actually isn't interested in just randomly inviting a friend over because she hasn't done that before. And I'd think, oh, what a perfect match. You know, this particular child, uh, they have the same interests. I'm, I'm happy that, that I've met their parents. Of course she wants this to happen. And so then I would be surprised when she would be like, mm, mom, I, I, no, no, I'm okay. And I'm like, oh, Darn it. I blew it again. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't read the cues. Missed that one. That's all right. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. But it is. Yeah. And that the differences between kids, that temperament's a huge factor in those differences between our kids. Um, but yeah, to be able to notice them and help them navigate the world with the gift they were given in their temperament, their factory settings versus their siblings, which is a different model. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. Two different models. And, and the idea, again, that you know, some of the, the exact same trait can be um, difficult at one age and not difficult at another age, you know, mm -hmm. so same child, same trait, all of a sudden, you know, now in school, we, we maybe don't value their high activity level as much as we did when they were an infant and we were hoping they would learn to walk and crawl, right? And now yeah. their high activity level is an issue in the classroom because they're, you know, fidgeting and, and wanting to get up and move around. So, same kid, same trait, different age. And different We feel differently about. And different expectations. Yes, the expectations, expectations versus reality. Yes, oh. yes. Yeah. Oh. And so, okay, we always like to wrap up our episode with a few little segments at the end, one of which focused on this idea of how do you take this information into your reality? And this season in particular, right. we're focusing in on one 
kind of developmental task in particular, right? So what do we got for middle childhood? Yes. So we really wanted to think about, okay, at 2 a.m. when parents are surfing the net, right? And parents of six to 11 year olds are still doing this <laughs> at 2 a.m., right? So this particular age group, we really, we kind of talked about it off and on is the idea of them being in these social circles and how does temperament impact those relationships outside of the family? How does temperament help them in the group? How does temperament help them get into the group? Mm -hmm. um, and how does temperament come into play, you know, with all of those relationships and social cues? Oh, yeah. And so we have a couple that are really awesome from Raising Your Spirited Child with Mary Shidi Kursinka, uh, but that we thought a lot of these tied, whether you have a spirited child, a flexible child, um, you know, a more mm -hmm. fearful or cautious, we thought all of these could come into play. Um, and so the I, I have two that I'll start with. And one of them, okay. actually, my sister will laugh if she hears the episode because she always teases me about how much I love the word boundaries. <laughs> and <laughs> this, this first one is, is to be able to recognize your boundaries. And so helping your eight-year-old set their own boundaries, right? Like this is not a thing I'm okay with or recognize the boundaries of others. Like it's okay for your friend to say they're not ready to share that or it's okay mm -hmm. for your friend to say, I don't like when we do this. I'm like, and it's okay for you to say that. Um, so helping them learn about boundaries because that's a really big part of social relationships. Um, it is. And then also whether you have a high approach or low approach child, helping them learn to enter a group. So both ways, um, a low approach child might need some coaching about like, well, I don't know, you know, you talk about, I remember mm -hmm. you telling the story of your daughter physically leaning in towards children she might want to play with, but that her yes. feet were like glued in the cement. <laughs> yes. And so, mm. you know, that low approach kid could maybe use some help with how do I get started? Um, you know, versus mm -hmm. your high approach kid might need some help softening that startup of the jumping in, coming in, uh, coming in hot. <laughs> that might yes. be your high approach kid. And so helping them learn appropriate ways to kind of enter or be a part of social groups. Absolutely. And, and even as you said, like I can visually see her standing outside, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the edge of the playground, just leaning forward because she can see a group of children playing and she really wants to go play. And um, yeah, that, that just that idea of learning how to enter a group, mm -hmm. which again, then can bring us right into these next two ideas that Mary shares is resolving conflicts with words and the idea that helping children notice um, you know, just perceive different things. So helping children resolve conflicts with words really brings us back to that idea of the upstairs and downstairs brain, yes. right? So all of our logic happens in the upstairs brain. Our upstairs brain isn't fully developed till our twenties. And so this six to 11 year old, like gets barely halfway developed. Okay. So <laughs> let's give them a little grace. Right. And then the whole idea that the emotional center is down there in that downstairs brain. And Children, you know, getting involved with other children, that's emotional. Oh, are they going to accept me? Do I belong? Are they not going to accept me? Do I don't belong? And so it's sometimes easy for children to dive down into that downstairs brain and maybe use their, their fists or their legs to resolve a conflict, right? Kicking or yes. hitting, right? We don't often see that, but when we do, it, it really means something to them. Like, I am struggling here and I need help. Mm -hmm. And so practicing ahead of time, helping them with those words in times where they don't feel so intense and they mm -hmm. don't feel so frustrated with, mm -hmm. you know, not being able to get into a group or being asked to leave a group. All those types of things happen in this age group. Or, and then, or with oh, their siblings. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, siblings like, too. Or, <laughs> maybe use or yes. Siblings too. <laughs> yes, those siblings, right? Yes. So, yes. Um, resolving those conflicts with words and in, instead of our bodies. And then the idea that uh, perceptive, especially perceptive spirited kids, they can catch the subtle. And so we sometimes have to help them notice. Um, they actually, they already notice things. We just have to help them to interpret what they're noticing. And they might see, uh, so they might, they, uh, will you tell the story of your daughter and going the wrong way? Because I think that is a perfect example of they notice it. And they don't understand it. And we need to interpret it for them. Yes. Um, so I think I've told part of this story before, but we were usually I would t drop my daughter off at school and my husband, my co-parent would take my son to childcare on the opposite end of town. So we just kind of split the morning and 
on this particular day, I had both. And so I had taken my son to childcare and then was taking my daughter to school and we're getting closer to school. And she was mom, that blue house is on the wrong side of the car. Mm-hmm. And you know, I was like, it is wrong, <laughs> wrong. There's her adaptability, right? I struggle right? with this because wrong. I'm, well, I'm like, no, it's on a different side of the car. And she's like, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> um, yes. But helping her understand, I was like, you know, we took a different way to school than we normally do. Um, so she had noticed this small detail of our route to school. Yes. But helping her understand the reason it's different, right? You notice this thing. And I'm going to help you understand why that might be the way it is. So I even think of like, exactly. so-and-so always does this. Um, mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, how can mm-hmm. I help you interpret that thing, right? That particular behavior. Like maybe they're not ready for whatever. Maybe they don't want that or like that. But so we do, yes. we help our kids of this age interpret, especially those kids that are really perspective. They might notice it, mm-hmm. but they're like, I don't know what this means. Why is this this way? Yes. <laughs> And I can, I can even count on the, my fingers, the number of times that I was told I was wrong because that's mm. not the way the teacher said it was right. Oh. So during this age, we do have this idea that, you know, well, mom, you're wrong because that is not the way the teacher said it was. <laughs> so, so helping them to interpret the differences, helping them to mm-hmm. uh, find that flexible thinking, right? Yes. And so, you know, we mentioned our perceptive kids are noticing that and that our less perceptive kids might need some help noticing and interpreting. Mm -hmm. Um, But also along that high distractibility or high perceptiveness, when you pair that particularly with a higher sensitive um, temperament, that those kids can be very protective of their things, of their Mm, their stuff. And so (laughs) that's mine. Um, But so helping our kids, whether that's their particular temperament or not, learning appropriate ways to share, right? That might be your high approach, high adaptability kid that wants to just like, oh, I like that. And they want to go get it. It might help to teach them things like, you know, if that's somebody else, we might need to ask before we take Mm -hmm. it or to give your child that is more protective of their things. Um, In our house, it's like, okay you're allowed to have a few things that are really special to you that you're not ready to share. And so sometimes that's preparing like, okay, your cousins are coming over. If you don't want them to play with this Mm -hmm. toy or this special animal, you need to put it somewhere that, you know, it won't be out for everybody. And so, but those skills that with their temperament, how that impacts the way they play with other kids um, or interact with other kids, but helping them learn to share and navigate that. It does. And we might have this expectation that at this age, they should be over that, so to speak, yeah. lack yeah. of ability to share, but because of their temperament, that might be still hanging around at this age, yes. right? So the expectation is this, but the reality is that their temperament is still telling them, you know, but that's super special. And I actually don't want them playing with this. I actually yes. don't want to share this. I actually don't want them in my room. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> you know, so, so that idea of that goodness of fit, how can we as a parent come to understand their temperament and what's happening with it? Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, th- as adult, there are things that I'm like, Mm-mm, I don't want to share. Yeah. I even think of this <laughs> no. TV show that was with food. It was like, I don't share fries, right? I don't. Yeah. Share <laughs> um, but even as adults, we have things we're not ready to share. And so, but helping Absolutely. our kids learn to navigate that. And then a few more, one of which is to help our kids get through the transitions. Um, Mm -hmm. And I heard a phrase the other day, so this comes with adaptability, but other traits as well um, related to these transitions and changes and unexpected. But one about momentum versus motivation. My friend talked to me about I love that. that. Right? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we're like, get motivated, get going. And it's like, sometimes we just need a little momentum. And that's the case for our kids too. Sometimes our less adaptable kids, it can feel hard to get started. And so sometimes Mm -hmm. it's a matter of helping them navigate transitions of we can help with just this one part and help them get started and then maybe they can get rolling. Um, So that's just another tip for these school age kids and their temperament. Yes. And finally, from Mary's book, Raising Your Spirited Child, the idea that we need to celebrate success. We need to celebrate the temperament that they were gifted with. We need to celebrate the small successes that happen when uh, they add an app to their factory uh, (laughs) settings, right? We need to celebrate with them that they recognized that even though their intensity level felt like they wanted to lash out, Mm. they took a great big breath 
and they use their words and celebrating their temperament helps them build that confidence, build that self-esteem, build that sense of belonging. And that gives them the confidence then to continue to go out. And again, they're, they're working on mastery at this age. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about how can I navigate successfully and feel good about all those things? Yes. We want to celebrate all those pieces along the way. We do. All right. And then our final segment that we like to bring in, uh, we like to bring in one of our teammates here and we call this our stop, breathe, talk space, which is our flagship parenting strategy. Um, you know, we typically bring in our producer, but today you might recognize this face from last season, our content yes. curator and writer, Barb Dunn Swanson. And so she's going to join us and ask a little question kind of off the cuff. Here. She is. I feel like I need to say, Barb, what are you thinking? <laughs> That's what we spent all of season six. It's only right. Yes. <laughs> that is so good. I have just enjoyed the conversation because I am want to build upon that celebration that you just talked about. We are going to celebrate two different groups. We got to celebrate these parents mm -hmm. who intentionally honor their child's temperament. No matter where your child individually falls on those temperament spectrums, mm -hmm. they're all temperamental gifts. And so mm -hmm. just because someone is potentially low adaptability, that's not a negative. That's not. Correct. Or if, right, or if they are um, a low approaching or if they're high mood and as you mm -hmm. talked Mackenzie, you said, I can maybe be uh, called silly at times. That's not a negative. And so we want to make sure we reframe how we think about mm -hmm. who our children are in their temperament, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then celebrate those classroom teachers who, in fact, have a classroom full of individuals who have all certain different kinds all of, of them. temperamental all traits, of them. <laughs> all of them. And so then yes. how do they manage to help each mm -hmm. of those kids enter a group and or mm -hmm. accept someone new into the group? You know, it's one thing to try to enter a group. Well, then it's yes. a whole nother thing to have someone enter your group when you kind of want it kind of closed, right? Yes. Oh yes. my goodness. The other thing I want to say that's really, really important is exactly what you were talking about, Lori, the essential elements of positive youth development. Mm. Kids yes. all want to belong, no matter how mm -hmm. they get there. Yes. No matter who helps them, whether it's a parent, helps them navigate who they are in terms of their temperament, who they are, as a member of the family, they want to um, belong. And so yes. any way that we as adults in the life of a child can help them uh, belong successfully, that's going to be so important. Helping them enter yes. a group, helping them find their way, find their voice, help them um, develop the uh, flexibility that's needed to be part of a classroom. And teachers do that every single day, help those kids. Oh, they do. Um, do that right yes. and then the other yeah. one is the mastery that's the other part of yeah. uh, positive youth development kids want to be successful and one of the ways they get that success is by being in a classroom full of other kids who have those boundaries that you mentioned <laughs> my favorite word <laughs> right. yeah <laughs> because those boundaries are a protective factor mm -hmm. and those boundaries help those kids learn that we don't all look alike and we don't yeah. all think and learn alike. So there's room for all of us in this classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. why I'm celebrating this classroom teachers. Yes. Because it's those classroom teachers that. who build the environment. Because home, the home environment is different than the school environment. And then those parents welcome those children back home at the end of a long school day. And you <laughs> talked about it. Some of them have to... <laughs> rest and recover from being in that classroom all day long with all kinds of different kids who have different temperament traits than they have. And it's a fine dance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. Between environment and between individual 
uh, classmates Mm -hmm. and between what our parents, how they help us and how our classroom teachers help us. So those are the things I'm thinking about. I, I uh, think I've said enough. I I won't even come up with a question. I just want to (laughs) celebrate this great conversation and the nice um, collaboration between temperament, our individualism, and yet um, how they fit nicely with that school age child. They do. They do. Yes. Mm-hmm. Aw. Thanks, Barb. I always love You're Barb's so perspective. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much to celebrate in our school age kids and us as parents and teachers and mm, there is. Stuff. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. You're mm-hmm. welcome. <laughs> So we've been able to share today about the idea of the middle school age child, the elementary school age child, that child from six to 11, and how does their development, those milestones that happen during that age span, what happens alongside temperament when we put those two together and what does temperament enhance? Um, Where do we need to help our child learn Uh, How do we give them the skills and opportunities to take what they got at the factory setting, right? (laughs) And add some apps uh, Mm -hmm. so that they um, have um, opportunities to belong and build confidence. And at the same time, again, that that bi-directional parenting, we're learning from them, they're learning from us. And how can we create a better fit, that goodness of fit that Thomas and Chess talk about um, with that child of this age? Did I forget anything? The only thing I can't even think to add is, yeah, just, but I I mean, we could say it every episode of, yeah, that the traits that we were like, oh, thank goodness I had a toddler who was blank. And they're like, oh, (laughs) now I have a child who is blank. (laughs) Right? right? Yes. Um, And so how we see, and you know, that's one of the huge reasons we talk about it's not good or bad. And even like between Mm -hmm. you and your co-parent, your co-parent's like, oh, thank goodness we have a child who is. And I'm like, oh, Mm -hmm. it's hard for me. It's hard for me. That bi-directionality. But yeah, different at every age. And so it's interesting to see how our kids' temperament come out, how it's going to come out to play in middle childhood and how we'll hopefully see them begin to kind of increase their mastery as they Mm -hmm. move through middle childhood, you know, getting a little older, you know, those 10 and 11 year olds and what they're navigating looks different. So yeah, it's good. And I hope that you maybe caught a little bit of this on the way, but they're getting to this age where you can talk with them about their temperament and you can share with them some of the insights you're learning about temperament and, Mm -hmm. you know, interpret for them what it is these feelings mean and interpret for them how they can use those feelings and um, you know, move into different social circles. Mm -hmm. So, well, yeah. And you know, that goes with that, that confidence too of using positive language to describe their temperament of like, you know, you like to Mm -hmm. check it out before you dive in, like what a beneficial trait or, you know what, you get so excited. You're so willing to try new things, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and helping them see the positive and the strengths that they have with like Barb said, with the gift of their temperament. Absolutely. So thanks for joining us today on the Science of Parenting podcast. And we want to invite you to subscribe to our podcast. Uh, Go ahead and, you know, give it some stars. That helps us pop up to the top of the list when people, you know, uh, throw parenting in their search engines. And so feel free to subscribe so that you know every time we drop a new episode. Yes, please do come along with us as we tackle the ups and downs the ins and outs, and the research and reality all around the science of parenting. The Science of Parenting is hosted by Lori Kothals and Mackenzie Johnson, produced by Mackenzie DeYoung, with research and writing by Barbara Dunn Swanson. Send in questions and comments to parenting at iastate.edu and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non-discrimination statement or accommodation inquiries, go to www.extension.iastate.edu slash diversity slash ext.